between Anna and Ben. Party. So now diagnose the Republican Party. We'll get to that in just one second. First, it can is that obviously on economics, you have some significant disagreements in terms of you want more government control and regulation of, of industry generally. Uh, you're a big fan of, of labor unions. Definitely. Obviously, you, you and I have a, a, a wide scale disagreement on that. I think that they radically raise costs, which is why you've seen so much business move out of the country and also why you've seen fewer and fewer members of the private sector joining uh, joining unions. Public sector unions are very powerful and robust in the United States. Private sector unions are, are, are increasingly not. Um, but you know, so what, what are sort of the big issues? You look at the Republican Party and you say these guys are just they're, they're out to launch. Well, okay, just putting policy aside for a second, it's more about what I'm noticing in terms of I don't know if fracturing is the right word, but the Republican Party is in a little bit of a pickle, right? Because when it comes to, and tell me if I'm right about this, when you look at Republican voters, it appears that they're certainly attracted to the MAGA type candidates. So they'll do really well in primaries. But then once you get to a general election and the battle is really about those independent voters, those candidates really do struggle. And I think that's what really transpired in the 2022 midterm elections, right? These Trump endorsed candidates who are further to the right, in my opinion, lunatics, <laughs> like they'll do really well, but then all of a sudden they kind of try to tone down their rhetoric to appeal to either moderate Republicans or independent voters in the general election. And it's not really working out for them. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, because I think you, just based on what I know about you, based on the conversations we've had, you're more of the, you're just a traditional conservative in my mind, really, right? And so, and I, I remember you having some analysis post midterm elections that was, you hit the mark on the head, like, or the nail on the head. It was, it was correct in that we need to stop promoting these like far right figures who aren't appealing to a broader electorate. What do you think the solution is going to be? Because I think your analysis is correct on that. So, I mean, I think that so much of this is attitudinal, meaning candidacies very largely in the primaries have become not about being far right politically. I mean, as you say, I'm a traditional conservative, which means it's hard to outflank me on the right. Um, but when, when it comes to sort of the attitude that's taken by candidates, that's what's attractive. And that's driven largely by the polarization. I think that in, inside the Republican Party, there's been a move which is sort of understandable based on how assaulted people feel by the media in particular, that the more people attack a particular person on the right, the more people on the right rush to that person's defense and say this person is just the best thing since sliced bread. And that is, I think people see that as beginning with Trump and it, it really didn't. I mean, I've been here the whole time. And I think that for, for a lot of Republicans that really started mainly with McCain, the, the, the sort of move from I can't believe these people, like John McCain is about as moderate a member of the Republican Party as it's possible to find. And yet suddenly he runs for president and he's the worst person. You probably. Entire world, he's garbage, he's terrible. What's going on? And then the Republican Party responds by nominating the most milk toast human being on planet Earth in 2012, Mitt Romney, oh, who is right, yeah. as inoffensive as dishwater. I mean, he's just, he, he's. He is just white bread. He's white bread with margarine. I mean, and, and everybody on, on the left immediately went to, he's, he's the most scary person. He's forcibly cutting the hair of gay kids in the 50s. And he's, and he's the person who straps a dog to the top of his car. And Joe Biden out there saying he's going to put y'all back in chains. Mitt Romney's going to put y'all back in chains? Like, what in the, and so Republicans responded to that. Many conservatives did by like, why aren't we fighting this? We need to fight. Whoever is willing to punch somebody in the face is the person we're going to support. And so that's... And that's exactly what we've been saying even long before... Donald Trump came on board, okay? And just remember, folks, <clears throat> there's a lot of things in terms of which I believe with. And so that's one of the things that I've been saying for the longest time. And I don't, in terms of with Ben Shapiro, there's a lot of things that I agree with him on, and there's things that I don't agree with him on. But I would consider myself to be a conservative as Ben. Maybe we describe our conservatism in different ways, but I'm a MAGA first conservative. I've always been MAGA first. And I know Ben obviously did not like Donald Trump because he was looking at all the other things. I was taking a look at the fact that what Trump was going to do for the country, Ben was looking at what Trump was not going to do for the country. And in terms of just his things that didn't have anything to do with the politics, or the policies, at least, you know, I'm concerned. And we wanted someone that was going to absolutely, right, you know, push back against 
all the crap that was going on. We wanted someone that was going to basically say, enough is enough. We've been, we've been kicked. You kicked John McCain. You not only kicked Mitt Romney, but you kicked him and you kicked him and you kicked him. These people are completely moderates, and yet you guys are making them out to be the worst thing since Genghis Khan. So come on now. We need someone that's going to go up there and basically say, enough is enough, and fight for us. Fight for the American people. And that's what we wanted. We wanted someone like Trump, and we got him. So in that regard, absolutely, America first, MAGA, Trumpism, you call it what you want, but that's what we want. Someone who's going to fight for the forgotten man, the forgotten woman, has a titanium spine, doesn't back up, doesn't give an inch, and is always completely on the offense, on the offense, on the offense, playing politics, and it's like in football, in foot in, in political football, if you got you've got to be on the offense, you've got to be pressing it, you've got to be out there. You can't play defensive, you're gonna lose the game if you play defensive politics. It's just not gonna work out. Let's continue. That's how you get Trump. And then Trump wins. And so because Trump wins, there's this sort of halo effect that has now accrued to people who are quote unquote punchers. Now, I do think that the, the solution to that for the Republican Party is to find people who are smarter punchers. I, I like the punching. I think the punching very often is necessary, right? That's why I like Governor DeSantis in Florida. I think he, I think he's intelligent about how he throws punches. I mean, like him or hate him, the guy's much more strategic than Donald Trump. When he, he also didn't take any of Trump's bait. I mean, right? No, I mean, he, he's, yeah. he's a very strategic thinker. He's somebody who really tries to pick his fights, right? If somebody tries to pick a fight with him, he is not always going to pick up the glove and, and just slap back. Trump's big thing was you can't hit me without getting hit on any score ever. And, and that's not the stance. So I think that the, the idea that the Republican Party is not going to be combative in the future is wrong. It is going to be, comb and it's okay to be combative, but you have to pick the right targets. By the way, the same thing is true on the left. Mm. I mean, I, I think that, that when you, you see Democratic candidates, very often there's an attraction to sort of the most wild-eyed because it's like, wow, the right really hates this person. They must be really, really fantastic. I think you see some of this from the squad. But there, there are definitely counterpunchers in the Democratic Party who know how to punch and are, and are much more strategic in how they go about that. That is, I think, the future of the Republican Party. That's at least the hope of the Republican Party. If not, what you're going to get is whoever says the wildest thing and draws the most fire is by necessity. You, you, what I've said to Republicans is you're essentially letting the left pick your candidates. You're letting the left target the person and then hit them. And the more they hit them, the more you're like, that guy's great. Love that guy. Say, well, maybe they're hitting him. Yeah, because he's on the right. Maybe they're hitting him also because he's a bad candidate and because some of the stuff he's saying is crazy. Yeah, I mean... Herschel Walker was not. He's a bad candidate. He was a I'm terrible sorry, he's a candidate. Bad candidate. Absolutely terrible. I mean, same with Oz, right? I mean, and that's the other thing. I feel like the quality of candidates has really gone down, and it's it's really that that has accelerated post Trump, and it's like. I guess anyone can run for Senate now. Like, what's going on? I mean, that is a serious job. We've got a hundred senators. It's an important job. You got to be. Look, I, I'm not like some elitist that thinks like, oh, you, you have to have this decorated record and, you know, you've, you've done this and you've done... I, I like ordinary people representing Americans, but smart people who have actually thought through the policies they're promoting. I feel like you're right. There's a lot of rhetoric going on. I see a lot of that on both sides. A lot of negative campaigning where everything is about attacking the other side. Ooh, the other side is so scary. So you have to vote for us because if you don't, the other side's going to win and your life is going to be miserable. And honestly, it, I don't really notice much of a difference if it's a Democratic, uh, I'm sorry, a Democratic administration or a Republican administration. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of talk. I feel like there's a lot of show going on. But when, it, when policies need to be passed, and I think this is partly due to how our institutions are set up as well. Nothing really gets done. Well, so I think that the purpose is that nothing should get done. But I think that the problem is that actually, in spite of that, things continue to grow. So I think we have an increasingly incompetent yet intrusive government. And so that's a bad combo. If you're going to have a, com a government that is, that is very intrusive, it better be damn good at what it does. And it seems like precisely the opposite. All of our institutions are failing to actually perform on the promises that they are promising. And then they promise in response more promises. And then people are like, well, that guy is promising a lot, so probably he'll do the job. It's like, well, maybe no one can do this job, which, again, I keep coming back to the localism point, but I really think that it's easier to get things done on a local level than it is on a federal. And it was designed that way, and I'm not sure that that's a, a bad design. I think we have outsized expectations of what the federal government can do. And what that means is that whoever promises the most and talks the biggest is the person who's likely to do well in national politics. Yuval Levin has made the point, the, the sort of 
uh, center-right philosopher at, at AEI, he, he, he made the point that, that when it comes to Congress, when it comes to the Senate, it used to be that Congress and the Senate, these were institutions that shaped the people who went into them, right? That you became a congressperson, that meant you learned the rules, you learned the ins and the outs, you right. figured out exactly how policy got made, how the sausage, you cut the deals, you did the stuff in the back room, but then you campaigned on it, right? It was an actual thing that shaped who you were, and now, instead of it being institutions shaping the person, the person uses the institution as a platform. So the real reason that you go to the Senate is that eventually you can get a show on MS NBC. The real reason that you go into Congress is that eventually you can get a, a contributor slot on, on Fox News. That basically, people like you and me who are in the commentary business, people who used to maybe aspire to go into politics, it's now the opposite. People go into politics aspire to go into the business that, that's that, so that we true. are in, actually. That's so true. I, and by the way, I find that so disgusting, right? I, I, disgusting both for the media outlets that instead of hiring trained journalists, people who actually want to do unbiased reporting, instead of hiring them, it's like, let's hire, you know, some operative within the Republican Party, someone who's in Biden's administration. I don't think that that's the right way to go. Uh, I think, you know, the, the partisan media is becoming more and more ingrained into today's society, and that's leading to more of the divisions that are not conducive to finding solutions that Americans want.